Welcome back to the 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. My name is Wayne Kimmel, Managing Partner of 76 Capital, the sports tech venture capital company. And on this show, I get the opportunity to interview top sports entrepreneurs, athletes, and executives who are shaping and many times changing the overall landscape of the sports business industry. Today, we have a great guest, and I'm really excited about this one today. We're going to talk baseball. We're going to talk sports business with former major leaguer Sean Green, now the co-founder and chairman of Greenfly. Sean, welcome to the 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. Yeah, thanks. I'm excited to be here. Uh, it's great to have you on the show. I'm so happy we bumped into each other in Salt Lake City, of, of all places. Uh, we were both there for the NBA All-Star Game and the Tech Summit, and it was great to see you there. And I think we, the time before that, we bumped into each other at the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. So not That's only right. not, not bad places we see each other at. Yeah, no, it is. It's, it's always fun to get a chance. When you're in the sports world, um, as an entrepreneur, you get to do those things. As a former player, those those days are kind of over other than, you know, the baseball side of things. But um, the NBA is definitely a, a result of being a, an entrepreneur and, and having a partnership with the NBA. Well, you know, normally I, I, I jump in and want to talk about, you know, the our, my, you know, our guests background. But you just said something really interesting. And I, and, and I was going to talk about it a little bit later, but I think you touched on it right now is this idea of having access and being able to be go into rooms and be around you know, in kind of on the other side of the velvet rope and in, on the inside. Um, do you believe that your playing career and being a professional athlete has helped you get some of that access that you're able to have on the business side of the world today? Yeah, it definitely has helped quite a bit. And there is, there is kind of a, an underside that I think hurts, but um, yeah, access, getting those initial meetings and, um, you know, being in a meeting and having someone say, oh, I was a big fan, you know, Dodger fan or Blue Jays, whatever it is, like that helps a lot. But what actually hurts, I think, is um, at first it was hard. I think people don't take athletes seriously as entrepreneurs. Um, and, you know, I, I, I understand why in the sense that there there's a lot of former athletes that are, you know, trying to just kind of bounce from one thing to another and spin something up. Um, so you have to kind of get past that as well. So there's even, even in hiring, it's like, oh yeah, you know, I was excited to talk to you because I was a Dodger fan, but you know, I'm actually like surprised that your business is a real business. So you get a little bit of that, I think as well. And, um, but I would say the access has, has definitely been more beneficial than, um, I think the having to prove the credibility side of things. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things that I thought was really amazing is, you know, and, and certainly Adam Silver and the NBA do an unbelievable job of putting together a room that of fill of full filled with people that there's there's probably no, it was probably like zero people in that room that you wouldn't want to have a conversation with. Uh, it, it was pre, it was pretty incredible. And when you have the when you have these those kinds of opportunities and certainly we were we were, you know, I feel so lucky to, to have been able to to have experienced that. Um, certainly can help um, in the growth of, of, of any kind of business that you're involved with. Yeah, the NBA is amazing. They, they're just a first-class organization. I love the whole culture of the NBA, everything they stand for. Adam Silver's, uh, you know, it's hard to imagine a better person to run a sports league and a global sports league that's, you know, become so popular all over the world. Um, and, and because of all that respect, I think, that they have outside of just being – people being fans, they, they attract, you know, team owners, they attract, you know, top tech entrepreneurs, um, celebrities. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, who turns out for that thing. The only, the only hope is that you're in somewhere that's not too cold at this time of year, because it's right in the, the, the heart of it all. But, um, you know, was, Salt Lake City was a great venue. And, uh, you know, I, I look forward to that every year. Yeah, it really was, was amazing. And, you know, but so I want to turn back, you know, a little bit to to your, um, you know, growing up in California, going to Stanford, getting drafted in the first round of the MLB draft. I mean, share, share with all, all us like what what that was like being, you know, being able to kind of kind of have your childhood dream of. Of, and then and then going on, you know, and playing, you know, you played for the the Blue Jays and then on your for your hometown team, the Dodgers. I mean, what was that all like? Yeah. So it was, you know, looking back, it feels like it was a different person, a different lifetime ago. 
Um, but yeah, growing up, I always planned on being a baseball player. It's kind of funny in eighth grade, I, I ran for class president because I remember sitting on the floor of the auditorium at my junior high school and seeing all the, they had a big picture of each president, you know, on the wall. And I said, Oh God, it'd be so cool to see a major league baseball player here. So I'm going to run for president. So like, that was my mentality. It wasn't like, you know, I hope I make it. It was just kind of what I, and I was obsessed. And, um, I think some personality traits, like I've definitely got some OCD in me. It runs pretty deep through my family. So, um, you know, once I started getting into baseball, I was fortunate as a kid. Um, one of the kids on my team, when I was like nine years old, had a, a pitching machine and we had an empty side yard at my house. My dad put a net up and the kid put his machine in my yard. And, and so I had the van, we had practices and stuff there, but I would just hit all the time. And then he took his machine back a couple of years later and then we got a machine. So I just hit all the time. And that's kind of, um, you know, it's the whole 10,000 hours thing. I, I just played a, a lot. And, and the more you play, the better you get. And then it becomes even more fun. So that's kind of what happened with me. Um, and then in high school, I, I signed to play with Stanford. And that was kind of the plan. And then, you know, I started getting a lot of attention, you know, as the draft was approaching. And um, I think a lot of teams were, were hesitant to draft players that were signed at Stanford because in, I think historically there'd only been two or three that had ever signed um, professionally. And because in, in baseball, you can sign as a senior in high school when you graduate, or if you go to four-year school, you have to wait till your junior year after that to sign. Um, so there's that three-year, um, you know, stretch, you have to stay there. And so I, I signed with Stanford and then the Blue Jays ended up drafting me in the first round. And, and I, I was the whole, I broke my thumb. So I couldn't play that summer anyway. And so they, they just kind of stayed quiet. And my, you know, advisor, which was my agent, I couldn't say agent back then. Um, there was no NIL. Um, so they didn't, didn't really talk to me. And then all of a sudden I'm on campus. And once I would have walked into class, I couldn't sign anymore, but I actually went to the first baseball practice, you know, in Stanford uniform. And then they offered me, you know, a bunch of money at the time. And, you know, I, ultimately decided to sign and I stayed there and went to school. So I, I went in the off season to school and then played and then would co go back to school and never, never finished. But, you know, I was, I didn't want to, you know, go and, and, uh, you know, play for five or six years in the minor leagues, not make it. And then all of a sudden say, okay, I'm going to go back to school now and mid, late, mid to late twenties. So that was kind of my, my thought process. And I'm happy I did because, um, you know, I got a chance to experience both. So you got to, you played with the, the, Toronto Blue Jays. And did I, do I get this right that you got a, a world series ring in 1993 on the, on the team? I, I got a world series ring. Yeah. against uh, against for Phillies, but I was, you know, I was, oh, I was over six in my September debut. So I don't think I helped a lot, but you know, maybe, uh, you know, I came in and played the day after the Blue Jays clinched the division and gave Joe Carter a rest and Joe Carter. Had hit. So maybe he would have got hurt that day and who knows. Right. So I, maybe I did yeah, thank, that walk off. Yeah. That really, I don't have any sort of memories. <laughs> <or anything. laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Well, I mean, the blue Jays and Phillies were always sort of like kind of sister clubs in that spring training is, it was the closest spring training to spring training teams back then before I think teams shared facilities, um, which a lot of them do now. And uh, so we played, we played the Phillies, you know, 10 times in spring training every year and knew those guys pretty well. Amazing. Amazing. So you, you spent a, a number of years, you know, with the blue Jays and then getting that opportunity to go to the Dodgers. And that must've been a super exciting for you and for your family. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of a strange thing. Cause you know, my first few years I platooned and it was kind of a sore subject. I, I just, you know, for whatever reason, I just didn't, the manager didn't want to play me every day and it was kind of a frustrating thing. And then all of a sudden we get a new manager. I start playing every day and, and played well. And the next year I, I made the all-star team. And now I'm, I've played five years and one more year before free agency. So the team told my, uh, my agent, Hey, they're either going to sign me to a long-term deal or trade me. So I don't walk in, in free agency. And, and obviously the, you know, the way they value players was different. Now there's much more value on the, the younger players and, you know, the, the draft you know, compensation, all that stuff. But back then it was more about, Hey, we don't want you just to walk and get nothing for you. Um, so I decided, you know, I wasn't going to stay and, and uh, kind of gave me, it gave me some leverage to sort of orchestrate the trade because whoever was going to trade for a player that's a one year from free agency, wasn't going to give up their prospects to have that person walk. So you get a 72 hour window and, 
you know, long story short, I ended up um, kind of orchestrating that through my agent to the, to the Dodgers. And, and that was a thrill getting a chance to go home and play. And, and uh, my parents, and I got, they gave me four tickets just for my parents. And I said, here, you guys deal with these as your tickets. I don't, don't bug me, uh, you know, every day on it, but, you know, enjoy coming to the games. And, and it was pretty great. Is there, is there anything, you know, today, you know, now as a, as the chairman and you know co-founder of a, of a pretty six, I wouldn't say a very, very successful business in the, in the world of sports now. Um, what, what do you miss about playing baseball? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I definitely like, I left the game and actually if I would have kept playing the most likely team, I think I told you before would, would have been the Phillies because the guy who drafted me and was kind of like, um, yeah, everyone sort of, we used to call it like have the sugar daddy that, that loved them. And he was kind of the guy that, that, you know, always saw big things for me was Pat Gillick who built the, you know, the world series team in Philly. So he had approached me and, and anyway, looking back, I thought I'd known you guys would win the world series and, you know, I would have done it, but, um, yeah, so I was, I was still, you know, pretty young and, and I was just kind of burned out of the, of the lifestyle. I have, I have two daughters who are, you know, approaching school age, but, you know, in terms of playing, you know, I, I think the game itself just became um, more of a, a cause of just anxiety and, and all that. it became more of a job, the actual like, game itself. But I loved batting practice and being around the guys and, and, and just even, it's kind of sounds cheesy, but I actually miss being outside every day in the same, you know, cause you get really used to your body almost, you get in tune to the seasons. And if, like, after I stopped playing, one of the weirdest things was that um, everything just kind of blended together, like winter, spring, summer, fall, especially living in California, just like, it just kind of just time wasn't as defined. Whereas before it's like spring start, you're in Florida um, for spring training. And then all of a sudden you feel the summer coming and then oh, it's getting, getting kind of cold and dark sooner. And the, the all the, the way the, the sun is the different stadiums is different and you know, it's fall. So like those types of things, um, it sounds cheesy, but, but I, I definitely miss that. You know, um, one, one last baseball question, um, or, or sort of baseball question. I mean, right now we're, we're all watching the world baseball classic and, you know, I, I, I remember you had the opportunity playing for, to play for team Israel. Um, and you know, they, when we're taping this, you know, they've won their first game in the World Baseball Classic. And what was it like playing for playing for them? No, it was fun. I mean, it was I was a player coach and you know, I hadn't played in like five years. So I, I think I was almost 40. And so it was definitely pretty rusty. And it was I, my eyes were totally different. So that was kind of a tricky thing. Like I wore contacts and so anyway, it was it was challenging in that regard, but being around, you know just a, a super like smart group of guys and, you know, having been one of the few Jewish players, but, you know, now I'm with other guys from that era that like Brad Osmus and Gabe Kapler, who I, who were Jewish players at the time I played. Um, we always had this like kind of unwritten camaraderie and we went through a lot of the same things. You go to different cities and the different Jewish publications or JCCs when you come speak in the different cities. And so we kind of had this, you know, you know, this, this brotherhood and now to have the younger players who, you know, really we were their favorite players because, you know, they all looked up to the Jewish players before them. And it was just, it just created a, a great dynamic. Unfortunately, we didn't get past the qualifier. We lost the last day, but um, four years later, the team did, did do really well. And that's why they're there now. And um, I don't know, this year they got a ridiculously hard bracket though. I think they got the hardest bracket. I think it's like, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Dominican. I mean, geez, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really good for, for the country of Israel as well as the Jewish people throughout the, throughout the U S and Canada. Yeah. It's really, it's interesting. You say that it's one of the things I, I would say to my nephew, I'm like, well, why is Garrett Stubbs the backup catcher for the Phillies, your favorite player? He's like, he'd say, uncle Wayne, <laughs> you know why? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> he's like, so he's so, he's so excited that he, you know, there's a, a Jewish baseball player on the Phillies. So he's very excited about that. And uh, well, that's, that, that's, that's an amazing story an amazing, amazing opportunity that you had to do that even after um, playing all those years and being an all-star twice and all the things that you did um, as, as a player. And so while you were playing, did you think that you were 
going to go into business? Did you have sort of this entrepreneurial itch? Did you have an I, the idea um, at, at all? Not in this way. I, I, I always wanted to get into some type of business. And I think it's, it's, it's kind of a strange thing when you're playing, you're, you're really focused on your career and, and even advisors or agents or you know, financial advisors, whatever it was, they say, look, the best thing you can do is succeed on the field. And all the other stuff is, you know, yeah, there's, there's different opportunities, but just don't get distracted and focus. And in baseball, you play so many games that it's, it's harder, I think, to, to start to think about other things while the season's going on. Um, but I did, I did have a desire to, to learn stuff. And the other thing that's kind of a, sort of a bummer is, you know, once you take the uniform off, you're, you know, with every year that passes, your access and all that stuff drops, you know, exponentially. So, you know, if, if players had more of a, I think more of a willingness to put themselves out there while they're playing. And you see a lot of NBA players doing that now and, and having great success with it. You know, it's, it, I think that's a big advantage. Um, so when I do talk to players that have, you know, asked me about green fly or whatever that are currently playing, I'm like, Hey, just so you know, like this is now is your time in the off season or whatever it is. Like now's the time you have to, to do that and, and start to build, you know, that second career, um, even if it's just through relationship building at this, at this stage. But um, yeah, no, I, I think for me, I sort of fell into it a little bit. Um, I, I got excited about tech and just kind of spun up a, a prototype about 10 years ago. Um, and knowing that similar to, to when I was a baseball player, I didn't want to be like the guy on the team. I'd like to be kind of the, the wingman. So knowing that, Hey, if, if it, if there's some teeth to what I've just kind of spun up, then, you know, I, I need to find someone more experienced, smarter than me, particularly in technology that could, that could be the, the one to build this and, and be a co-founder. And that's, that's what happened. So tell us about that story. So how, how did it all come about? I mean, you, you, you said you, you spun this up and, you know, and how, how did you even think about sort of the beginnings of, of green fly and then talk about the, the team that you've put together? Yeah, so I I had an idea to build a, just really a video Q and A platform, and you know I was still getting hit up for questions, um, you know things that were relevant that I was relevant to in current games um, from my career, and you know I was hey can you send shoot a video and send it you know smartphones were just pretty new but they were starting to you know show up everywhere so my thought was hey why don't I build an app that can create, that could connect, put a network of people that are experts, could be like team doctors, could be you know, a bunch of former players and things like that, and then sell access to that network through a layer of tech. And that was really the thought process around it. And my, uh, my cousin, you know, he was a brilliant guy. He was president of the Harvard Law Review and had a you know, career in, in a legal role. He was at the DOJ, the FCC, uh, head of internet policy at the FCC. And then he came out to to be the head of corporate affairs at Activision Blizzard, um, which, you know, is based in LA. So we got, we started to spend a lot of time together. Again, we grew up together and he got excited about what I was doing. And, um, you know, it's, it's always tricky when it's family. Cause you don't want like, you know, he had two young kids. He had this great job. It's like, do you want to do this with your cousin? Do and, and he's, you know, as I said, a smart guy and, um, you know, did his research and decided, Hey, I want to, I want to do this. So he jumped on board. And, and we just went through a kind of a, just a standard, um, you know, young startup approach where we, we did a friends and family round, brought in a, a dev team because originally it was um, this, you know, prototype that I outsourced. And so now we have this product and we started, we did a couple little trials, one with the Blue Jays where we had former players on there talking about the trade deadline and different things. And it was actually really cool. And so then all of a sudden um, college football is going on and we did a deal with uh, just a, a, you know, just kind of a proof of concept um, around a college football game, Notre Dame, where we brought in um, some former players from Notre Dame lore. I mean, some good players like Tim Brown and, and, and uh, um, Michael Haynes and, you know, different players like that. And we did the same kind of thing where they were providing content. And that led to a deal. We actually, our first paid deal was we did March Madness with CBS and Turner about, which is relevant right now, 
Um, and that was probably 2015. And we brought like a hundred different you know, celebrities and former players, um, people like Ashley Judd for Kentucky and Tom Arnold for Iowa, Christian Leitner <laughs> for Duke. And we, and you know, Tom Arnold gave a, a pep time, a uh, half, a halftime pep talk, you know, was, they were like a two seed and they were losing. He's like, Hey, you know, I bounced back. You guys can bounce back. I married Roseanne and I, I landed on my feet. So you guys can do it too. So this is pretty funny. And I think they ran it on air. Some of the stuff was online. And, um, and what happened out of that was um, LeBron and Maverick Carter had just launched uninterrupted and they had a deal with Bleacher Report, um, which was a Turner property. So they had visibility into what we were doing. And, you know, they approached us and Maverick said, Hey, I'd love to license your tech. And at first I was like, wait a second, you know, this sounds really competitive. Should we even have this meeting? And then the light bulb went off really for Daniel, especially um, Daniel Kirshner, my co-founder. And he said, you know, why are we banging our head against the wall trying to build this network when every league, every team, every like, side property, like uninterrupted, they all have their own network and we built really good tech at this point, we have our team in place for a year and they've redone the whole platform. And, and so that's what we did. We started licensing the tech and then the, the product evolves quite a bit from there. It's like, Hey, when you have, you know, the, the league and the, the team and the, the players on a platform, they also want access to their own content. And so it, it just sort of evolved from there. And then we created this kind of bi-directional short form content um, infrastructure for, for leagues and teams and, and the players and brands and, everyone who needs access to that content. Well, well, I'd love to hear more about that. I mean, and share that with, with all the, you know, viewers and listeners about, you know, the growth, right? So you and, and Daniel, you kind of, you got this thing going. And then, as you mentioned, all of a sudden the leagues, teams, media companies, I mean, they all started coming on and now it really has become that sort of that key piece in the middle of, of, of all of this conversation. So how did all that, how did that happen? Well, in some ways we were too early um, because the product, um, you know, was it, the short form content wasn't as valuable as it is now. Like right? now for a while, I was like, okay, yeah, maybe you can just give the, the athletes something to, and, you know, give them a tweet or something that they could you know, pre-populate so they can do it easily. Um, but what's happened is, and as you know, well, as you well know, the, you know, fandom is as great as it's ever been, but the way it's the way sports are consumed is changing and short form content has become more and more important where, you know, an NBA fan in Europe isn't necessarily watching games, but they're huge, they're huge fans, but they're going on TikTok or whatever and watching the highlights or wherever they're consuming it. And so, you know, the NBA has done a great job um, in particular with the NBA plus app and they're getting, you know, now they're starting to monetize that content. So for us, we work with most, um, major leagues around the world where, you know, we have, we do deals with the league software as a service and the league then uses us in different, they use us to gather all their content with their staff. So the staff will be on the green fly app and um, they have people on the back end and they get set up. We have all these integrations. So whether it's, you know, someone like Getty images or, you know, photo shelter or WSC, you know, anyone that's like clipping content or photo software, it all integrates and we pull all that content in and, and automatically there's AI within Greenfly. So it automatically will tag the different athletes or the, the events that are happening within the, within the action. And it'll get automatically distributed to the players get off the court or the field or the pitch. And the 99, over 95% of the ones in those leagues will have our app on the phone. And they, you know, the PGA just happened, you know, Scotty Scheffler is you know, downloading content, sharing on his social, um, and that's, you know, that's basically when you see most content in sports on athlete channels, it's coming through Greenfly. Um, and it could be also going off to broadcast partners or sponsors because we'll identify the logo and then the sponsors get access to their content. So it's, it's however the league wants to set it up with their rights and all that type of stuff. Um, where, where the pipes that move that content automatically where they need to go. So when you, when you, think about the business today and where, where it's been and where you're going to take it. I mean, um, what, what was the, you know, w were there certain things that have happened over, over time? Was there kind of a one customer or one group that really tipped things over for you? Yeah. So I would say both NBA and MLB have been very innovative. MLB was one of the 
the first, if not the first to do this, this live content coordinator program where they actually had staffed, you know, each city with someone to just capture, you know, content that was supposed to be social first type content. So sometimes it's captured on their phone. Other times it might be on a, you know, digital SLR camera, but um, it's, you know, behind the scenes stuff. And, you know, a lot of times it'll be vertical video for TikTok or whatever it is. So they're, they're capturing all this content. And, and that's, that's kind of our, our big strength, like to, to be able to, to pull all that in instead of having it like sit in silos and on someone's hard drive or Dropbox folder, or, you know, trying to, to slack it. And then the content kind of get disappears over time. You don't know where it is. So now to have it all in a, in a place where it's, it's unlocked, like that's where the value um, has, has been created. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the type of thing where yeah, now the value of the short form content has gotten to be, such that, you know, at first, when we first started, it was more online, you know, we were hoping for broadcast or online and then, and then social became more of a marketing expense. And now it's, it's, it still can be that, but it's moving more and more to the revenue side for these organizations because they see how much opportunity there is um, to, to find ways to monetize either with the brands that they're partners with, whether they're, you know, selling a Jersey deal, like the European clubs that we work with, they're getting more, bigger dollar amounts for their Jersey deals because they could prove that they're not just sharing the content through their own channels, but they're sharing it through channels of, of their players who have, you know, probably an aggregate. Some of some of these teams have over a billion fans, you know, based on these superstars that they have on Instagram and TikTok and all that. So um, there's real money behind it. And that's why we're super excited because as an infrastructure tool, there's a lot of opportunity for us to continue to iterate and be more and more a part of, of that side of things. You know, you mentioned that how, how athletes and celebrities can really move the needle on social. Are there certain individual athletes or that you've, that have done unbelievable things, um, you know, for you and on, on green fly that you, you, that you can sort of, you know, share some of those examples. Um, in terms of, athletes specific examples um i mean no it's like there's a ton of examples i mean there's there's so many athletes that are that are using green at this point um but you know pre saint germain's one of our customers and, and the reason i i throw them out there is just because of you know the level of fandom that their stars have like you know mbappe is on there all the time sharing content um, Messi's on there all the time sharing content and you know instead of sharing that type of content that has their you know their jersey on there with the logo instead of sharing it you know maybe once every couple of weeks now it's multiple times a week so I mean the, the the level of impact that has is you know is there's different ways to quantify it we, we integrate with um, you know a couple partners um, that have ways of, of calculating that Um, So for what it's worth, you know, I mean, it's millions and millions of dollars, like tens and even in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars that they're, you know, based on calculations that they're getting um, just by getting more content out on these mega, mega channels. I mean, top five in the world Instagram accounts. Well, you mentioned growing up, you had the batting cage next door. You know, or batting cage, you know, next to your house, you, you know, you were always hitting and out there all the time and working hard. And, you know, are, can you almost analogize what it takes from a, from a, from all the different traits and being able to, you know, really work hard and, and try to make things happen to become a professional athlete? Are there similar traits and qualities that you have to have also to be successful on the green fly side of the world as well? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think, you know, that there's so much that um, correlates. And, you know, the difference, I think what doesn't correlate is just the, you know, kind of the immediacy of sports. And if you're in a slump and you have to figure out how to like put a bat on the ball against Randy Johnson um, when you're already over 15, like that's, that's a different type of deal just because there's so much physicality. Um, but what translates really well is understanding the ups and downs. Because, I mean, you know, someone who, invests in a ton of startups. Um, I don't care how successful a startup is. There's, there's times when you think we're done. And there's times when you think 
we're going to be a, you know, a multi-billion dollar company. And it's just to understand the same thing in, in hitting. It's like, there's times you feel like I'm never going to get a hit again. And there's times where you feel like oh, I figured this out. And then you, over time you realize that neither one of those is true. And you just got to kind of stay on that even middle path. And that's something that I got pretty good at in baseball was just like kind of riding the ups and downs. And the other, the other, I think biggest thing is, is understanding your team and, you know, what's going to motivate certain people. Like when some people might need a little bit more of a, of a, you know, a kind of like some stroking, like you're going to be, everything's fine. Just relax. You know, you got this. And some people need like, Hey, you need to pick it up. And so it's, it's understanding, you know, the difference between the personalities and, you know, I was never a manager at GM in baseball, but um, you know, how to build a good team and, you know, who's going to fit in. And that's like, even, even now we're, we're in a process of building, adding some key, some key hires. And, you know, that's, you know, as you know, it's, you could have great ideas, but you got to execute, you got to have the right people there. And that's something that um, you're constantly trying to get right. And if you know, you're not getting it right, you got to make a change. Well, Sean, this has been awesome having you on our 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. And as we as we wind down here, I have one last question I wanted to ask you. You know, you know, many of the things that we many of the different guests that we have on our show, we, we they talk about there, there was some there was a certain someone in their life, a mentor, a friend, a parent, someone that has really helped them not only with their athletic career, but also their business as, as well. And really something that's kind of been their their guiding light as they've gone through through life. Do you have any special person that you that you sort of think about or has helped direct you in, in, in you know across all the amazing things that you've done so far in, in, in your life and career? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely the baseball side, it's easier because uh, my dad was always, uh, and, and I think it's, it's pretty common with the guys I played with, whatever country they were from. And, I, you know, Carl Stogato is a great friend of mine. And a quick little anecdote is I remember one time sitting in a, in a cab in Chicago, heading to the park, he was in a bit of a slump and he's in, talking Spanish, you know, yelling Spanish on the phone. He goes like this to me, he goes, my dad's telling me how to hit again. And, you know, he's talking, so it's, and I had the same thing. It doesn't matter where you're from. You kind of have that, you know, a lot of, in a lot of cases, it's the dad, it could be an older brother. It could be, you know, an, an uncle or, you know, a coach or whatever it is. But I think a lot of guys who make it have someone that kind of helped push them through the harder times. Um, I think, you know, from the entrepreneurial side, I, you know, that there's a lot of people along the way. I mean, I, I'm fortunate to have, you know, my, my cousin, Daniel, who I, you know, I trusted and I mean, he's, he is, you know, the, the brains and the brawn behind the success of our business. Um, he's like, just grinds away. And so, you know, I would say, even though, we're co you know, co-founders. He's the guy that, that I definitely look up to as someone who um, knows how to get things done the right way and is going to make sure it, you know, everything needs to happen. is going to happen. Well, that's amazing. It's amazing. You know, for you, I love the story. Wish you the best of luck. You got to keep making it happen. You, and I know you will. So I uh, look forward to seeing you soon and hopefully at a warm place somewhere. Um, but yeah, again, right. Maybe <laughs> baseball star or something, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe, you know, at Dodger Stadium on a, on a beautiful night, that would be a, a great place to Dodger Philly, Dodger Philly, NLCS, right? There you go. Uh, that'd be, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sounds again, good. Sean, thank you so much for joining us on our 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. We appreciate it. Wish you the best of luck and we will see each other, I'm sure, soon. Take care. Sounds good. Thanks, Wayne. Absolutely.